with uh, and wanted to have three questions uh, that I asked and maybe a fourth. So that's three and a possible. It's also a reference to a game that I enjoy called Spades, uh, where you predict out what, uh, how many books you'll win for the game. And, uh, and so that's very exciting. Um, one thing I'll say as well is, as we all know, Preservation Month uh, and this series in the work is about not thinking about preservation as locked in the past, but what does the next 50 years look like? And preservation is being one of those key drivers uh, for that. And so Three and a Possible, in the way I'm also thinking about it, is, is a prediction. It's a, it's a conversation with the future. It's a conversation with uh, how many cards or books you think you'll win. Uh, and so today, I'm super excited to open this series uh, with the incredible Mary Means, uh, who is best known for leading the team that created the National Main Street Center at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. She is the author of Main Street's Comeback. Uh, excuse me. She's the author of Main Street's Comeback and How It Can Come Back Again, uh, which is a great book, by the way. It was published in 2021 at the height of the pandemic that overnight changed everything for small businesses. Most of the 1600 communities with active Main Street organizations have fared significantly better than others during the pandemic. Mary was a Loeb Fellow at, Har at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. For over 30 years, her small but mighty planning firm helped communities and other public interest organizations create strategic plans with wide public support sparking momentum that overcame inertia. Her work has been honored by the American Planning Association with its 2018 Planning Pioneer Award and by the National Trust for Historic Preservation with the 2020 Crown and Shield Award, the highest honor in historic preservation. Now, of course, we know Mary Means' work is absolutely incredible, and I wanted to invite her on uh, as the first interview in this conversation because of what she's meant uh, to me in my career. So as many of you know, I am the, was the founding director of the National Trust for Historic Preservation's Hope Crew Program, which stood and stands for the Hands-On Preservation Experience. And in 2013, we were, Mary, I don't know if you know this, we were still at, uh, we hadn't moved to the Watergate yet. We were still in, in DuPont Circle. Uh, and I had just started. And when I walked into the trust, I had the, the office with all of these shirts that had Hope Crew on it uh, and the name, and that was it. <laughs> and I remember sitting in the office with uh, Deb Wise uh, and she was over, she overheard me kind of, thinking about, talking out loud, drawing on pieces of paper, balling them up, throwing them away. And she told me, you need to call Mary. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought, I was like, of course, I, we should talk uh, because you through Main Street um, and the work that you did, you really uh, hacked how you build something that's completely different than what a national organization had done before. Uh, and to me, that was what Hope Crew was, was I was envisioning it to be, which is this, you know, conversation with new people, new communities, yeah. ways of thinking about preservation, which in the 70s, where I'm sure it was some of the same conversations that you were having about how you develop out Main Street. And so that that two hour conversations we had on the phone was um, helped shape how I developed out that program. And I, I appreciate your insight, your expertise, your guidance to this day. Uh, and so I wanted to have you on to, to be a part of this conversation. I also want to uh, highlight that uh, our connection with the Loeb Fellowship, our also connection at other organizations that we worked at together. So our paths are very similar. So super excited to have you on. And so Mary, I just wanna jump right into it, if that's sure. okay. Sure. So what experiences or events led you to the field of preservation? How did you, how did you get here? Well, before I jump into that one, I want to take off on the, you and I both were there when the National Trust was still in a majestic building on DuPont Circle. And then it moved to the Watergate. Yeah. And I was really surprised to see that, but it was a good place to be. Last night's reception for the outgoing president of the National Trust, Paul Edmondson, was held at the new National Trust office 
which is in the former Garfinkel's department store building in downtown DC. And believe it or not, they're in co-working space, which I thought was just so 21st century, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, the organization itself, I think, is doing a lot of adaptation. Let me get back to your question, though. Um, how did I get into this? I scratch my head sometimes. My fa I grew up in Atlanta, and my father was a classical architect. Um, he worked for a firm that did houses mainly, but also a number of public buildings. And he developed over his early years a fascination with the 18th century as classical architecture. And as kids, our family would go on vacations to places that had a lot of history and character, Charleston, Savannah, New Orleans. Um, and he would inevitably end up with us having to go, and I say having to go, to house museums. And as a child, these were utterly boring. The only thing that was memorable was going to Kenmore in Fredericksburg, Virginia once. And the only thing that was memorable about that was they were making gingerbread in the kitchen, um, the outdoor kitchen, and that was sort of what stuck. If anybody out there is wondering how you penetrate the mind of a small child. But somehow or the other, I grew up knowing that there were places that were not like suburban at the time, sort of faceless Atlanta, places that had a lot of character and a past and a kind of sense of rootedness. And I loved history. And I found that I wasn't suited for an academic career in history, but I really saw the opportunity with the activist side of it. And this was in the early 1970s, like 1970. So we had barely gotten the National Register going uh, and barely gotten any legislation really. Um, so I kind of came in a, as uh, preservation was taking another uh, sort of a leap forward in the 70s uh, towards where it is today. And there's, therefore I've, I've been in it for 50, over 50 years now. I guess yeah. I'm eligible for the National Register myself at this point. Yeah, no, no, I, you know, Mary, I really like this idea of a, a leap forward and you mentioning, uh, you know, preservation's roots and as a part of like this activist tradition, like it, you know, the National Historic Preservation Act was 66. So it was born of a time where activism yeah. was, was in the air. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I just, I appreciate these, these connections here uh, historically for, to your, to well, your point and how you got I, into I think, it. I think another part of it is in those early days, uh, the National Trust and an awful lot of the people who were inclined towards the preservation message were, like my father, kind of stuck in the 18th century. My dad actually thought the last decent design had been done about 1815, and he turned his nose up at, at things after that. So there was a real um, kind of leaning towards an elite. Um, that's a pretty limited, narrow slice of the population. Mm -hmm. um, I was hired by the National Trust to open an office in the Midwest. And when I got out there and I, I'd asked, what, was, what am I supposed to do? And they said, you're to make preservation happen all across the Midwest. I'm going, well, I better get to it. Uh, but what I was finding was the, the kind of definition and practices and etiquettes of preservation at the time were just not flying among the sensible people of the Midwest. It was like something, I literally would be told, this is something for Charleston or Boston or something, but we're out here in Kankakee or wherever, and we're, we're just old, we're not historic. Um, and I realized after a while that we really needed to do something to broaden the appeal and to find hooks that people could get into it in a way that wasn't just us selling the pure, uh, unadulterated elite historic preservation that was kind of the, the currency at the time. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, also the thing I think about Mary too, is with in, in our, you know, there, this preservation we taught and we, you know, we know what the, the formal trajectory is, but I also think about those communities um, that are, that have been doing preservation. They're in it. They may not call it that, yeah. uh, but yet it, it still resonates. And so as I'm thinking about this, you know, this, uh, activist tradition. Also, when I think about preservation, I think I, I include those people in it too, the people who were not formally recognized or the people sure. who didn't have the funding to do that, to that, do that work. Like they're coming, um, you know, to this for many different ways and reasons. Uh, and it, it all kind of, 
uh, creates this perfect storm where yeah. you have people who are who are thinking about preservation in one way, and we you know we still have those you know those people in parts of our community and our mm -hmm. our, our our industry, and then people who are on this cutting edge who are thinking about preservation in, in these new and exciting ways, which leads me to to my next question for you, which is what are what are some projects you're working on? What are what are things that you're you're thinking about mm -hmm. currently? Well, um, after I Let's say the first draft of the book that became uh, Main Street, Main Street's comeback and how it can come back again. I had my best friend read the first draft and she came back and said, boy, I didn't know a lot of this. It's really interesting, but I can't figure out whether it's a narrative or a memoir because right now it kind of seems like it's both. And I went, ah, no wonder I've been having trouble kind of figuring the voice. So I'll write the narrative and then I'll write a memoir later. So I rewrote the whole thing. Um, so now it's out, it's done very well. I've been um, honored to be able to make a number of keynote uh, addresses around the country. Um, and I've been working on a memoir now for a couple of years. It is the hardest thing I've ever done. It makes creating the Main Street program kind of pale by comparison. And here's why, here's why. And I think that you and probably a number of people listening will appreciate it. In your professional career, you generally write in the third person. You're, you're not in the story. You are an observer, you're describing, you're recommending or whatever, but you're never in the story. Right. In memoir, you are the story. And it means turning it completely around and putting yourself in your voice in the middle of it. Hmm. And I want to tell you what a struggle that has been. It's taken me a long time to kind of make the kind of breakthrough to do that. But uh, it's keeping me, um, it's keeping my mind from going completely gray. So I'm really enjoying it. But professionally, the thing that interests me most right now um, is the coming tsunami of church closings. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very active in my Unitarian Universalist church. I I've chaired the building committee. We're doing a big renovation. And I've learned a lot about the finances of churches. And I've also seen how most churches are struggling financially because spirituality and religion has dropped. And there are thousands and thousands of churches across the country that are going to be vacant in the next 10 or 15 years. Now, that's a, that's a sad thing for spirituality and for community because they're sources of great community. But it's also a real problem for communities where they are prominent in places like a Main Street. There, there are towns that have several mainstream religion uh, churches in their downtowns that are going to be vacant. And they're going to be much harder to repurpose than the department stores, which were the white elephants of the 1970s and 80s. So a couple of colleagues and I have been drawing attention to this before it becomes more of an, more of an issue. Because the sooner we recognize this and how complicated it is to work on it, the sooner we can start working on it. Um, it's been a neglected field, and I can tell you why. It's a very difficult problem to approach. Yeah, yeah. And have you, have you are there any you know, uh, shining examples of where that you've seen a, a city or a main street get it right just yet? Or is it, are you, um, you know, still in the early stages of this? It, this is definitely something that is at a fine grain. There is no one solution that can be kind of replicated uh, in many places. You'll hear, well, so-and-so got $10 million for their church building. Uh, yes, it happens to be near Wall Street and property values alone. But in yeah. Boise, you're going to have a different situation altogether. And you're going to also run into issues with things as it it's seemingly is helpful. The Secretary of Interior Standards um, being on the National Register makes you eligible for tax credits, which could certainly uh, help with the financing of something this complicated. But those large spaces that are sanctuaries and social halls, there's a lot of resistance to breaking that up into using it for things that might be um, quite compatible with the, with the building. Some of these are on the register, but they're not exactly perfect architecture. I'm not talking about the ones that are you know, truly gems and you wouldn't dream of, of doing anything um, ultra creative with the interiors. But yeah, so there, there are examples of them being turned into art centers. There's one that's uh, a climbing wall and like a, a gym, a pickleball operation. 
uh, art centers galore, but no community can support more than about one art center. Uh, yeah. So yeah, they're going to have to be some some solutions and some financing solutions set forward yeah. for them. Yeah, you're right. And I was thinking about there's an example in, in Baltimore where a church was was converted into a brewery using you know historic tax credit and, and creative financing. Um, yeah. Right? How many breweries can you have in in a city? Like, you That's know, right. Like, you're, right. You're, this is this is spot on. And, um, which also is a good segue into the next question for you, Mary, and, and um, perhaps my last. We'll see if a, is a fourth is possible. Um, what do you? What's the what's the future of historic preservation from from your experience? Wow. What do you, what do you, where, where's the field headed? Well, I um, I guess I'd, I'd start out by saying, early on when we were first starting to think about how do we do anything with this Main Street thing, this collection of buildings that no one's paying much attention to. Um, and they're, we're losing them because there's shopping centers coming in and competing and, and, and they're dying. So what do we do? And what we ended up doing, I think, as you said, it changed the trajectory of preservation because we had set out originally to say, we need to broaden the appeal of historic preservation. We somehow got to reach the power holders because a, a lot of the activists were great people and they worked hard, but they were hitting a ceiling when it came to those in the power structure. Yeah. So it was like, do we try to get them in the power structure or do we try to wake up the power structure? If you're going to do that, then you got to make preservation work where places that matter to them. And that was downtown because it was mostly, mostly men at the time and their offices were downtown. So what we inadvertently ended up doing was kind of mainstreaming preservation. Now, this was interesting because until recently, I don't think even the National Trust acknowledged that Main Street was historic preservation. It's like it didn't feel like preservation as it had always been. And yet there probably been more buildings saved and reused and more communities held together with the Main Street program than you know outside it. So I give that as background to say, I think we're gonna to need to do some kind of adaptive thinking going forward. What Main Street did was instead of saying preservation is the ends, we were saying preservation is the means to whatever ends you're trying to accomplish in your community that are important to you. So I'm looking now and saying today, the, the National Trust is saying preservation is a means to the end. And that is really true. Now, going forward, climate change and the climate crisis that is fast becoming much more than real is probably the biggest thing that we're gonna to need to cope with. And the only way we're gonna be able to do that is to begin understanding and communicating in ways that resonate with people the, um, the ecological value of keeping old buildings. And I'm not talking about just those that are very historic. I'm talking about reusing the things that we already have so that we don't have the cost and uh, environmental cost of demolishing, carting the stuff away, carting in new materials and all of that. You probably, you might be able to build with new technologies newer, but then when you take into consideration all of the clearing of the site and everything, stick with the old. So I do think that's one. And it's gonna cause us, I think, to have to really re-examine some of our old tried and true rules. Preservation has become very rules oriented. Um, many of the people coming out of, of graduate programs and all today are going to work for situ in situations that require compliance with rules or writing rules or whatever. We need to step back and say, what were they supposed to accomplish in the first place? And are they doing that in a way that is sustainable? And I don't mean just sustainable from a green standpoint, but from a political standpoint as well. And we need to have the courage to adapt some of those rules, I think, to be able to be a little bit more flexible in how we approach climate crisis and also how we approach equity and justice. Um, the example I would give is single family zoning um, is sacred in places that have it and too many places have it because one of the things it does is rule out people who can't afford to live in a single family neighborhood, which is a great great percentage of the, the future. Uh, it's a great percentage of the present. And right now I get sickened when I see how preservation 
people, people, NIMBYs, not in my backyard devotees, can wrap themselves in preservation and scream that we can't possibly put that acceler that grandma unit in the backyard of a, of a large house because there goes the neighborhood. Or more, more like, there goes the complete historic character of our place. You know, I roll. Yep. And yet, that we've gotten fairly gridlocked on this enormous issue of equitable sharing of, of housing in particular. Uh, so I really think the challenges for the future are our flexibility and our, our willingness to look at the very different challenges that we're facing in the 21st century and begin to adapt some of our 20th century thinking to be able to be flexible enough to address them. Mary, Will, Will said spot on, and, and we, uh, like so many others in the preservation movement, are all thinking about the, the, the future and using uh, preservation as a tool and strategy to help us all get there. Uh, I, I, I've asked the, the questions that I, that I wanted to get through, but I wanted to give you a chance to, to share anything else before we wrap our call today. Uh, this has been a, an amazing conversation, but wanted to turn the floor back over to you uh, to, to share any final thoughts. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I've been around long enough to see a, a long evolution of the preservation movement, and I can't tell you how uh, encouraging it is to me to see the, uh, the number of, of people who um, are going into it or are working within it, young developers, um, entrepreneurs and all, who are not white and are, and are not kind of from their, their fifth generation of their family to go to college, but they're folks who are younger and they bring a different perspective, not only to the physical dimension of preservation, but to the long missing part about the story. I mean, we can see the building, but we can't get any rush in terms of our emotional identification with it, many of us, unless we've got some way of knowing why it's important, who lived there, who worked there, who built it. And those things are coming out more and more, and I think it's way overdue, and it's making for a much more interesting field to be involved in. So I'm, I'm particularly happy with the work you've been doing, Monica, along with a number of your colleagues, in bringing that much higher onto the radar screen of the preservation movement. Uh, well, thank you, Mary, for, for that. And thank you for your decades long leadership and for joining the conversation today. You know, we could talk on and on and I am looking forward to continuing this conversation in person. So as we, as we wrap today, again, thank you, Mary. Thank you all for joining the, the discussion today. Uh, stay tuned for the, the next one. And please, please follow Mary on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram uh, and every Twitter. Uh, Mary, I don't know. It. <laughs> no, okay, so all the others, uh, please, please follow Mary. Uh, you know, she is a, a, a beacon of light uh, in this preservation field. So, well, I want to say that you are um, a little preservation light bulb on the rise yourself, Monica. I'm just <laughs> thrilled to hand the baton over <laughs> and rest. Take Thank care. You. Thank you all for right. inviting me. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for joining in. See you next time. <laughs>